Well, good morning. We're glad to have all of you here this morning and all of those of you who are online as well. Glad to have you joining us this morning. So let's open with a word of prayer and then we will begin our service. Father, we thank you for being with us. We thank you for how you continually just work in our hearts and in our lives. Father, I pray that you would be with this service, that it would be something that would bring uh, hope and an inspiration into our hearts and into our lives. And Father, that we would just be glorifying and communing with everything that is said and done here this morning. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray and I ask these things. Amen. Good morning. Did you see what that first word was? Was it big enough for you to see? It says joy. Do you have joy this morning? You know where the joy comes from, don't you? Let's look at Psalms 95. I've been in this psalm all week, and the kids are going to be in it this, this next week. But it's found in Psalms 95. It was written or give, it was attributed, actually, to King David. And this is an invitation to us this morning. Come, let us sing for joy to the who? Lord. To the Lord. And then let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation we have something to have joy about this morning if the lord is our salvation if we know the salvation that he gives us in our hearts we have joy this morning okay this first song we're going to sing is called the old church choir and one of the phrases that's going to stick out to you today is ain't nothing going to take away my joy all right and we're going to have fun with this this morning because these guys up here have no rhythm but they're going to ask us to do something with rhythm <laughs> There's a section that says, clap your hands and stomp your feet. And I bet they're not going to be on the right beat. But we're going to ask you to join us. So here's the words. Bruce, turn to that where it says, clap your hands. Can you turn to that phrase? Okay, so it's like, he's going to find that, that slide for us. Okay, so it's, clap your hands and stomp your feet till you find that gospel beat. Got it? Try it with me. Clap your hands and stomp your feet till you find that gospel beat. And then we'll sing another slide. It's on the slide. Okay. And then the next one's the same thing. Clap your hands and stomp your feet till you find that gospel beat. Don't watch them. Pay attention to the words. <laughs> okay. Old church choir. Ain't nothing going to steal my joy today. Yeah, the, tr the truth hurts sometimes. <laughs> Maybe you've heard this online. It's a fun song.
Tina Riddle just shared with us that this is a song that got her through some very tough times. Thank you, Tina, for that testimony. Okay, now we're going to sing a new name. Now, this one should give us some real joy. If we know salvation and our name is written down in the book of life, we should be joyful, right? So this is an old hymn. It's a good message about joy. <laughs> choose to be joyful today that's what this is all about trading my sorrows
sing a new one for you this morning. It's just very simply entitled Joy. And it's talking about how Jesus gives us joy down deep in our soul. And that's how we're able to withstand the troubles of life. And we have his joy down deep in our heart. Jesus, the more we know him, the more joy we will have knowing you.
we'll see if this still works after it bounces. Well, this morning, even after I break the remote for PowerPoint, the sermon will still be entitled, Faith Comes by Hearing, whether the PowerPoint works or not. And it's taken from the book of Romans chapter 10. Now, Romans chapter 10 is in a series of of chapters where Paul is addressing the Roman church. And he's trying to help the people come to understand how to become followers of Jesus Christ. And so we'll begin at verse number one, and my remote worked and everything. He says, brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. For I can testify about them that they were, are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. Since they did not know the righteousness of God and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Now, when you read this, one thing you have to remember is Paul himself was Jewish. And what he's writing about here is He's writing to a group of people that have not accepted the gospel of Jesus Christ because they have been trying to follow after the law. They continually seek to follow the law of God. Now, as it was given in the Old Testament, they had it. They had a set of rules. They had a set of regulations that they were supposed to follow, and that was how they had this relationship with God that they sought. But when Jesus came, that changed. He came, and Paul's going to address that here in a, a couple of verses, But it changed in the way that we approach God, not in the fact that God is still wanting to have a relationship with us. It's how that takes place. Now, to kind of broaden this a little bit, why did we get a law from God if that's not how he wanted us to come to know him? Well, you have to remember in the Old Testament the way that history unfolded. It unfolded first with the children of Israel, the the children of the covenant, going to live in Egypt while Joseph was there. While they went to Egypt and lived where Joseph was in charge, Pharaoh died, Joseph died, Israel died. All of these people began to reproduce. 400 years pass and Moses comes and he's going to lead them out of Israel. As they're leaving out of Israel, there are so many more. Depending on what source you look at, it's hundreds of thousands. Others say millions that that there were that were in Egypt. And as they were there, they were not a united people. They were scattered all over Egypt. They were, by birth, they were Hebrews. However, by customs and cultures, it's kind of like in the United States. We have a large number of different things. If you really want to try to understand something like that, go up to the northwest and order biscuits and gravy and see what happens. And yet when you go down into the southwest or in southeast, they know completely what it is when you order biscuits and gravy. If you want to to take a Thanksgiving in the northeast, they put clams in the dressing. That's not something that we do in the south. So you see, there are regional differences, and all of these regional differences are things that the people of Israel were struggling with as well, because they were diverse. They were from different families, and so they had, of course, different family traditions. When you put all these people together, they're going to have differences. And so God gave Moses on the mountain, he gave them the law. And he said, this is how I want to interact with my people. He began with, you shall have no other gods before me. I mean, that was the first and foremost as far as the the Ten Commandments. To remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. And the list goes on, all ten of them. Now, there were other things about how that they were supposed to worship and how that they were supposed to approach worship. All of those were things that they could do. And if they could do them properly, then they were able to be worshiping properly. This was what they wanted to hang on to. This was a point that throughout history, the book of Romans has been an eye-opening experience. When people really begin to dig in 
because when Martin Luther began to study in the book of Romans, he began to realize that faith was not something that was a works-based thing, but that it was a matter of belief. It was faith which brought salvation, not works. Well, the reason why he believed that is because where Paul begins to discuss this. And so he's telling them, you have been very zealous in seeking God according to the laws, according to the rules, the things that you can do, the things that you're in control of. You have been very zealous in this. However, this is in ignorance. Now, you need to understand something. There's a very big difference between ignorance and stupidity. Ignorance is a lack of knowledge. And so Paul is not calling them dumb. He's not saying that they're stupid. He's simply saying to them, you don't have the knowledge that you need to be able to have the relationship with God that you need to have, that he desires for you to have. And so he comes to this point, and he's explaining this to them because they need to understand they've got to move beyond the rituals. They've got to move beyond the law, keeping the rules. And so he says Christ is the culmination of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. We see there he begins to turn the corner. Christ is the culmination of the law. Well, what was the law there for? It was to draw people into fellowship with God. It was the way that we were supposed to approach God. It was the way that we were supposed to interact with God. He's not saying that Jesus did away with anything. He's saying he is the culmination of it. He is the way that we have the relationship now that it is given to us. One of the things that we struggle with sometimes is, is that we learn something and we think, okay, we've got this. And we don't grow, we don't expand, we don't build on those bases. You know, if you stop when you say, hey, I've learned to scramble an egg, I know how to cook. Life gets pretty boring if all you eat is scrambled eggs. But if you can make toast to go with those scrambled eggs, well, now you're starting to get somewhere. But what happens if you don't want toast and scrambled eggs anymore, but you want to have a cheeseburger? And you have no idea how to cook a cheeseburger because you don't know how to cook meat. You've been cooking eggs and toast. There's no meat involved there. So you want a cheeseburger. Well, you've got to learn how to make a cheeseburger. Now, we're not talking about master culinary skills. We're talking about basic skills. And we build one on another on another. When we learn how to say the alphabet, we don't know how to read because we know the alphabet, but it's a building block. It's something that we have to have as a basis in order to build. We take the letters that we learn, the sounds that we learn, we begin to build words out of them. We learn rudimentary words to begin with, and then we begin to expand as we get bigger and we learn more. At some point, we become proficient in reading. Well, this is what Paul is trying to say. You've learned the basics and how to have a relationship with God by following the rules, but you need to understand you have to have the relationship with Jesus Christ. And then following the rules is an outpouring of that relationship, not the way that you get to that relationship with God. So you see, a lot of the times when we try to live a righteous life because we want to be the righteous person, are we doing it with the right motive? Are we trying to live the life that God wants us to live because we're trying to impress him? Or are we living the life that he wants us to live because... We love him, and we want to have that transformation to become who he wants us to be. Well, Paul says this. He says Christ is the culmination of the law. All of these things that you've learned up to this point, Paul wants them to understand you have to take it now from a knowledge in your head about the rules and apply it in your heart by having this transformation. Now, the next couple of verses, 5 through 8, they're really confusing when you start to read them. And so we'll cover that, and then I'll come back and explain why. So in verse 5, he says, Moses writes this about the righteousness that is by the law. The person who does these things will live by them. But righteousness that is by faith says, do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? That is, to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the deep? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. 
But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and it is in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. Now, as you read that, as you you kind of try to ingest that, I've read it, I've prayed about it, I've studied it, I've looked it up in commentaries, and I still get kind of confused. What's he talking about bringing Christ down or bringing Christ up? What's he, what's he trying to say here? Well, these verses are actually a quotation or, or portions of a quotation from the works that Moses wrote in Deuteronomy. And so in Deuteronomy chapter 30, here's what Moses had given the children of Israel. He says, now what I am commanding you today is not too difficult for you or beyond your reach. It is not up in heaven so that you have to ask, who will ascend into heaven to get it and proclaim it to us so that we may obey it? Nor is it beyond the sea so that, we ha- that you have to ask, who will cross the sea to get it and proclaim it to us so we may obey it? No, the word is very near you. It is in your mouth and it is in your heart so you may obey it. So you see what Paul has done is, is he's taken the words of Moses. Now, what Moses has done when he's talking to the children of Israel is, he says, you have been given the knowledge to have a relationship with God. You have the knowledge to have this righteous relationship with God that you're supposed to have. And in Moses' day, it was based in the law. So Moses is telling the children of Israel, you have the law. You don't have to go to heaven and look for the law. You don't have to cross the sea to look for the law. It is near you. It is in your mouth. It is in your heart. Because they wanted to have the law, and Moses wants them to know that that's the righteousness for how to come into relationship with God. Now, what Paul does in the book of Romans is is he quotes this. And he says, okay, Moses said that you had the law. But what I want you to understand is, is is that if Jesus is the culmination of the law, that Jesus is just as near. The words that you have to speak are in your mouth, and it has to be in your heart as well. So what Paul is doing here is as he grew up in a Jewish household, as he was studying to be a Pharisee, as he was very zealous in pursuing a righteous relationship with God himself, and then he had an encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus. And when his life was transformed, he began to understand everything that I have been doing to this point. I've been blinded by the reality that God doesn't just want blind obedience to rules. He wants me to have this in my heart. He wants this transformation to be internal, not just a knowledge external. And so when he comes to this point and he writes to the Romans, he takes what Moses had said, And he's saying to them, just as Moses said that your laws are here so that you can have them, so that you can know God, what I want you to understand, he says, is you have the laws, yes, but you also know that Jesus Christ was here and that he was crucified. That's why you don't have to go to heaven to find him. That's why you don't have to go into the earth to find him. He has risen. And so Paul is telling these people this. Why? Well, what did he say at the very outset? He says, I want you to understand this because I want you to be saved. He wants them to understand this, and he's talking specifically to his fellow Jews. However, as you see in the scriptures coming up, he's not speaking only to the Jews. So he's just told them. He says, the word is near you. It's in your mouth and in your heart. Back to Romans chapter 10. Verse 9, he says, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You see, he comes to this point that he's explained to them that they have this knowledge that's in their heart and in their head. But he says that the relationship with Jesus Christ, it also has to be something that you mentally understand, but you also believe in your heart. You see, there's two parts to us that we really have to have in order for salvation to be possible. We have to have the knowledge, and we have to have the belief. 
the knowledge and the belief can't be separated in our relationship with Jesus Christ. We can't be saved if we don't have the knowledge of Jesus, and we can't be saved if we don't believe in Jesus. They're intertwined. Inextricably, you can't separate one from the other and have a relationship with God. This is what he's talking about is, is if it's based simply in knowledge but not in the heart, well, then they could follow that. They could follow the rules. They could do the things that they were supposed to do and never really have a transformation internally. You see, when it comes to relationships with God, in his love for us, he wants us to be transformed. It says in the scriptures to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's what Paul would say. This is where Paul is addressing the people that he wants them to understand you can have a head knowledge without a heart knowledge, and it's not complete. He wants them to understand that they have been following the rules, but following the rules does not make it the relationship that God desires. He says, however, if you declare it with your mouth and believe in your heart. So how can you declare something if you don't know it? How can you have this, this statement of faith if you have no knowledge of it? So you have to have knowledge of it, but then you also have to have a belief in it. Well, let's continue on. Maybe it will explain itself a little more clearly if you're still confused. He says, for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. So it is with your heart. Does that mean this pumping organ that's within us that pushes blood through our bodies? Well, no, not exactly. He wants us to understand that there is a deeper level than the physical body that we have. You, you do realize that. We as human beings are composed of more than simply flesh and blood. We have, and, and it depends on your theological position, whether we live as a dichotomy or a trichotomy. And you say, uh, what? <laughs> a dichotomy is basically that we have a physical body, but then we also have an emotional, spiritual, mental component. A trichotomy separates the knowledge from the emotion essentially. So as human beings, we have a physical body. Then we have a spiritual nature about us, which is what we call a soul. And then we have an, a mental capacity, which is what we consider the third portion in a trichotomy. Now, I personally believe that we live as a trichotomy, that we have a physical body, we have a relational aspect with God and a spiritual, but we also have the mental knowledge as well. In order for the mental and the spiritual to be united, he uses this, this how shall we put this, analogy of the heart? Because it is this internal component that he's talking about. Our mental capacity is, is knowledge. But the Spiritual is where he's trying to address. We can have the knowledge, but we have to have a belief as well in order to be who God wants us to be. Now, this is kind of confusing, and it has been confusing for 2,000 years since Paul wrote these words. But what he really wants to understand, and he wants us to understand, is that Jesus Christ and belief in him is the simple solution for having ability to know God. It doesn't have to be that complex. You don't have to know all of the laws of Israel. You don't have to know all of the scriptures that are in the Bible in order to become a follower of Jesus Christ. You have to surrender your will and make an assent that you believe that Jesus Christ is the Lord. You have to believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. Now, he goes on as he continues in this. He says that if you say it with your mouth, you profess it, then you're saved. Well, 
the reality is, is that we can say a whole lot of things and not really mean it. You know, when you walk in and somebody says, well, how are you doing? And you say, fine. Did you really believe that? Did you really mean that when you just spoke those words? Because you're thinking in the back of your mind, it is so bad, I don't really think that you want to get involved in all that. You know, it's just the gentle, polite thing to say, oh, I'm, everything's okay. I'm fine. Now, if that's not the truth, because you don't want to get into all of the things, well, you've just spoken something and not truly believed it in your heart. You see, you could do the same thing if you make a physical statement, yes, I believe Jesus is Lord. You can say the words, but it doesn't mean anything because you don't believe them. However, when you make that belief, when you have that transformation deep within your heart, why would we have to then profess it? Why would we then have to share that with somebody else? Well, because they need to understand the transformation that is possible. If they see you and you change your life, you're, you're, there's a transformation, it's one thing. But if you proclaim it, you become a living testimony for how Jesus wants to transform our hearts and our lives. And so we have this statement that if we believe in our hearts and we confess with our mouth, then we will be saved. Watch where he goes with this. He says, as scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You see, we began this chapter looking at the fact that he was speaking to the Jewish people. And yet he comes to this point that he comes to the conclusion, and he says there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. Salvation is for all people. But the only way that we can all have salvation is to profess it with our mouth and to believe it in our heart. This is the key of the gospel. This is the thing that we need to continually be reminded of, is that people need to know Jesus Christ in order to be the complete person for whom God wants them to be. Oftentimes, we overlook that. We forget about what God truly desires of people and what God desires in the lives of people. You see, as Paul continues in this, he comes to this point and he's telling them that everybody who confesses this, everybody who believes this, well, they will be saved. doesn't matter who they were or where they came from. In verse 14, he comes back and he makes a quotation from the Old Testament. And I forget which prophet it is. I think it's Isaiah, but Isaiah was quoting like, Micah or Nahum, I don't remember which. But he says, how then can they call on the one that they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? Okay, so now here comes the quote. And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? Okay, now here comes the quote. And how can anyone who preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Now that quote, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. What in the world can that possibly mean? Well, when you think of someone going from place to place, point A to point B, how do they get there? Walk. Back then they would walk. What about taking a car or taking a plane or taking a bus or taking a train or going by boat, by horse, donkey? But how do you get to the train or the boat or the horse or the donkey? You have to walk to it. So you see, our feet are this mechanical mechanism by which we can move. What Paul is saying is how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Because, yes, in these days, it would have been something where they were walking from point A to point B. And if they were walking and bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ, this is a quote from the Old Testament, because they were also in a difficult situation in this prophecy, in this time of the prophets, and it was talking about 
when you come and you bring the word of God, you have these beautiful feet because they are coming. They are bringing to us this wonderful word, this wonderful promise from God. So what Paul says here, what he's quoting, what he's implying here is that when somebody is walking and sharing, when they are traveling about, when they are going from point A to point B, sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, they have beautiful feet. Not because it's a physical appearance thing, but because it is their approach to sharing the gospel. Remember, there was no internet, there was no telephone, there was no email, there was no means of communication other than face-to-face, pretty much. Or if you carried a letter from somebody. But if you carried a letter from somebody and you walked there to get it, your feet were still bringing the message that was the message that was a beautiful message. So what Paul is talking about here is that everybody can be saved. But then he goes off into this and he says, how are people supposed to know that they can be saved if somebody doesn't tell them? How can they know unless somebody shares with them that they can have this relationship? How can someone preach and share that message unless they are sent? And then he says, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. You see, Paul's summarization here is pretty simple. He says, people can't know Jesus Christ unless they know about Jesus Christ mentally. How are they going to know mentally about Jesus Christ if nobody tells them? So blessed is the person who shares the gospel message with those that they come in contact with. Well, guess what, church? That's what we're called to do, is to be purveyors of the salvation message of Jesus Christ. You know, I've seen all of the stuff that's going on in the world around us, and I see that that the church has been dragged into a lot of situations. And as I'm praying about, God, you know, what am I supposed to preach this week? And he says, you're supposed to preach the same thing that has been preached for 2,000 years, Jesus Christ and him crucified, which leads to salvation. That's what the church should be doing, is proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. But who's supposed to be proclaiming it? The pastor? No. Every believer is someone who carries the message whereby others who don't know Jesus Christ can learn about Jesus Christ. You realize that the way that it works, according to the Scriptures, is is that the Holy Spirit calls people, that they begin to be awakened by the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what we as Nazarenes call, what do we call it? Privet. Prevenient grace, thank you. I lost the word for some reason, and and that's really confusing for me sometimes. But that's what we call prevenient grace. It's where God sends his spirit to awaken us before we actually know what's happening. And then when we are exposed to the message of Jesus Christ, we have to choose. Am I going to believe it and accept it, or am I going to just put it aside and ignore it? You know, for a lot of people... If you were raised going to church, this happened at a very early age, and you don't really remember what it was like before that. Even if you're an adult, that you came to know Jesus Christ as an adult, chances are you don't really remember that feeling, that knowledge that the Holy Spirit was moving in your life. You know, the Holy Spirit doesn't club us over the head, typically, to get our attention. But there's this hunger, this gnawing, this this emptiness within us, that we know that we're missing something. And it's in that, that moment that we are miserable. It's what we call conviction. This is where the Holy Spirit, in prevenient grace, and I'm going to say that word as many times as possible today so that I don't forget it. But this is how prevenient grace awakens within us. It gives us this knowledge. It makes us feel hungry for something. But we don't know what. Well, the only way that we can have that want, that hunger satiated is if we accept the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because this is what it really is. Back in the 80s, early 90s perhaps, there was a kids program called the Donut Man. 
And he talked about the fact that we have this God-shaped hole within us. That's what the whole donut thing was about, was the empty spot in the middle. That that's what we need God to fill that hole. There was a musical group, Audio Adrenaline, and this was back many, many years ago, back in the 80s again, that they came out with an album, and on it there was a song, God-Shaped Hole. This is something that we don't often hear much about, I don't think, in these days. I I haven't heard anybody make a reference to a God-shaped hole within us, and yet it is something that is very real, and it is something that is very, very important that we find the right things to fill that God-shaped hole. Now, here's the reality. If you have a God-shaped hole in your life, there is nothing in this world that's going to fill it properly. It's kind of like trying to put a square peg in a round hole. It just does not fit. You can try, and you can struggle, and it just doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? It's because it's the wrong thing to fill that hole. Well, if we struggle with drugs and alcohol, with money, with power, with positions, and we struggle with trying to fulfill that void that we sense within us because the Holy Spirit has awakened us, and yet we don't seek God to fill that hole, then we're going to be miserable because we won't have that fulfilled. You know, when you have that itch right in the middle of your back, the one that it's almost impossible to get to on your own. You know, that's why they make back scratchers. It's why they make door jams, so that you can lean up against the door, you know, like a big bear. There's this itch that you just can't fulfill sometimes. And it just drives you up the wall, doesn't it? It's just so irritating because you know that if just, just one scratch it, it would all be better. Now people are squirming in their seats because they've got that itch in the middle of their back that they can't fix. The power of suggestion. The reality is, this hole in our hearts, in our lives, in our souls, is the same kind of an itch that until we have it filled, it's just not going to work. You know, when you have a food craving, it's the same kind of a thing. If you want ice cream... Nothing is going to satisfy that craving until you have ice cream. You can eat all the chips you want. You can have peanut butter and jelly. You can go and you can cook that cheeseburger that you learned to cook earlier in the message. You can fix all kinds of things and try to stuff yourself and be miserable. Have you ever eaten so much that you're just miserable because you haven't eaten the one thing that would satisfy your craving? Can you extrapolate that? to what it's like to live a life where you ignore the call of the Holy Spirit and you keep trying to stuff stuff in that hole that you're yearning to fill and you're miserable but not satisfied. Well, this is what Paul is trying to help people to understand. That hole is only filled with the power and the presence of Jesus Christ. And the only way that people know what that is how that they can have that hole fulfilled is if those of us who know the answer will share that answer. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Well, you know what? We live in a day and an age where there's a whole lot of bad news going on. But the church should be a beacon of light because we do have the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it is that good news that helps to satiate that annoyance, that hunger that's there that we can't fulfill any other way. This is what Paul was speaking in the first century. And you know what? 2,000 years later, it has not changed. The only way to be fulfilled in that hunger and thirst that we have is to be filled with righteousness. And the only way that people can be filled with that righteousness is if they know what it is and how they do it. So when somebody mentions to you, you know, I just, I believe that there's something more out there that I'm just missing. Do you realize that that's a call for help? It's a call for you to be able to say, you know what, have you thought about or have you prayed or have you asked God? Have you considered reading the Bible to look for an answer? 
there are any number of ways in which you can engage in that conversation. But when somebody says something to you along the lines of, you know, I just really believe that there's more for me out there. It's an open door for you to be able to step through and to share the message of Jesus Christ. Paul continues, he says, But not all the Israelites accepted the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? Not everybody's going to believe. Not everybody's going to accept salvation. That's not your responsibility. It is not your responsibility to reach every person that you come in contact with so that you can lead them from point A to point B, point B being that they accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, and you get them into heaven. But it is your responsibility as a Christian to shine the light in the direction of Christ so that if they come to the point of accepting him, you have played a role in it. I, I'm going to guess that as you grow up in the church, if you grew up in the church or if you came to know Christ later in life, it wasn't a one encounter thing that brought you to that point of belief. You heard teachers, you heard preachers, you had encounters of your own where you picked up the Bible maybe and you read it. You maybe saw something on TV and you began to wonder. We do not live in salvation experiences in isolation. There is not one specific person that is responsible for leading this one person to Jesus Christ, I don't believe. But I believe that it is our responsibility as Christians to live the example and to be able to help them to know, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. Every incremental step towards Jesus Christ is of witness to the power of God being able to draw people to him. This is what our message should be. Paul, and I want to conclude with this verse, he says, consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. You know, Nowhere there does Paul talk about the theological implications of the cross of Jesus Christ or the tribulation or the rapture or you name the theological debate. He says faith comes by hearing the message. What message? That Jesus Christ cared so much about us that he came to this earth and he died for our benefit. He paid the price for sin. And as he came and he paid the price for sin, he was resurrected from the grave and he ascended into the right hand of God in heaven. You begin to get a little more theological as you grow in that relationship. But what Paul is trying to do is he's trying to introduce to the Roman people the message that salvation is for everyone and that we as believers have a role to play in taking that message to a world that doesn't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So this morning, I, I think that the proper question for us is, what does my testimony say when people speak to me? What is the life that I'm living, the way that I'm acting, the things that I'm doing? Am I spreading the good news of Jesus Christ? Because it's very easy to get caught up in things of this world and not really stop and consider that we are or aren't being ambassadors of Christ, but in reality we are at every turn. We need to understand that people are not always going to accept Jesus Christ because we share our testimony with them. But if we never share our testimony with them, how can they know that God loves them and wants them to come to him? I think that the thing that we need to really constantly be reminded of is God is in control. He just needs me to love people and to be an obedient follower of him. And let his spirit do what his spirit is supposed to do. How beautiful are the feet of those that bring good news. This morning, I'm going to challenge you to go out of here 
and to have those beautiful feet sharing that gospel message of Jesus Christ. But as we close, I also want to give people the opportunity that if you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, that you have that opportunity. It says that if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that you are saved, then you're saved. So, you know, we have a lot of simple techniques that people have used. We have the ABCs of salvation, admit that you're a sinner, believe in Jesus, confess that you are or unrighteous and that you've been saved. We have the Romans road where you can take somebody and show them the different scriptures through Romans as to how that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and, and you go through that process. But I think that this morning, the impetus just needs to be, I now know what's missing in my life. It's Jesus Christ. And so I'm going to lead a prayer that you can ask Jesus into your hearts and then I will conclude the service in prayer, and we will go out and we will share with the world the love of Jesus. Father, I pray that you would reach through the powers of the Holy Spirit into this congregation, both in person and online. And that, Father, if anyone has not accepted Jesus Christ, that they would be able to to simply acknowledge this. If you would like to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, you say something along this line. God, I know I'm a sinner. Please forgive me of my sins. And I invite Jesus Christ into my life to become my Lord. If you pray that prayer or something similar to that, you have just invited Jesus Christ into your life. That's what Paul says it there. Tell people, confess it. Father, I thank you for how simple you have actually made this for us to come to know you. And Father, I pray that we would go forward and that we would share this message with all that we come in contact with. That we would be able, Father, to have the beautiful feet of those who spread good news. Now, Father, I just ask that you go with us as we dismiss from this service and that you would just continue to work in our hearts and in our lives and help us, Father, to be the witnesses that you would have us to be. And we ask this in Jesus' precious holy name. Amen.